uh, I'm going to be talking about restricted Boltzmann machines uh, applied to maximum satisfiability. This is joint work with several collaborators at DeepMind. Uh, David Bart Farley, especially, he's an equal contributor to this work. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start out by saying something that's super obvious to this audience. Um, but yeah, I think it's nice to start with something obvious. So there are two, two big trends happening, uh, I guess, in machine learning. So one is the rise of deep learning. Obviously, you've heard of all the amazing applications across so many different domains. Uh, all the way from speech recognition, image recognition, translation, various games, proteins, and now like we have these amazing generative models um, that's making a lot of news. And then, you know, maybe the other trend which is somewhat less discussed is the immense amount of compute power that's sort of growing and enabling all these big breakthroughs uh, in terms of either GPUs or TPUs. Uh, and if you look at you know, how the performance of these hardware accelerators um, has been changing across the last few years, you can see that you know, they're not affected by the slowdown of Moore's law. You see like incredible increases in the compute throughput um, from, from this specialized hardware. Right, so just to give you a sense, uh, for example, the V4 TPUs, uh, if you use an entire pod of such chips, which contains 4,096 chips, that has a peak performance of you know, more than one exaflops. Obviously, like, you, you don't hit the peak performance, but still um, just the raw compute power provided by these accelerators is absolutely amazing. Um, so... What does that imply for discrete optimization? Uh, so with deep learning, now it becomes possible to learn sort of very application-specific heuristics or search algorithms um, and directly from the data for that application. Right? So imagine you know, every application is characterized by some distribution of problem instances, and you can draw samples from it as training data. And now you can create, by learning on that training data, you can construct an optimizer or some kind of search algorithm that's hyper-specialized for just for that distribution. So that is uh, a meaningful advance in the sense that like, if you look at a lot of existing algorithms, they are mostly sort of off the shelf things and you have like a few knobs to sort of customize them for a particular application, but nef definitely not the kind of specialization that learning would enable, right? So that brings the promise of okay, much better performance for optimization algorithms and search algorithms for various discrete optimization problems, which sounds very exciting. The second implication is so a lot of the classical algorithms that are used for discrete optimization are heavily optimized for CPUs, right? um, not surprisingly, right? because before uh, a few years back, there were no accelerators available to design algorithms for. Uh, but you know, obviously, CPUs are like the the Moore's law is slowing down and a lot of discrete optimization algorithms have been benefiting by riding on top of Moore's law for the past several decades, right? And that advantage is going to stop, and now it's going to be you know purely algorithmic improvements that are going to make a big difference. Um, unless we change our hardware, um, and, and particularly hardware that is not um, being limited by the most is slowing down of Moore's law. Um, so, for example, the neural network accelerators that I mentioned um, could be a new hardware target for discrete optimization algorithms, right? And if we can figure out how to make use of this incredible compute power, um, then maybe we can sort of su survive beyond uh, the death of Moore's law. Now, accelerators obviously are not general purpose are, are not as general purpose as CPUs, obviously. Um, so they accelerate 
very specific computations. In the case of neural network accelerators, you can think of matrix multiplication as being the primary operation that's being accelerated. So you lose generality by switching to this new hardware. But if you can figure out how to make use of this specialized uh, computations in your discrete optimization algorithms, then you get to make use of all the compute power. So in this talk, I'm going to actually talk about something that fits into this second implication that I mentioned, and less in terms of the first one. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to talk about, in some sense, a new design point. If we consider you know, the space of hardware and the space of algorithms, you know, this is sort of picking out a new point in that space uh, where there is a particularly good fit between the algorithm and the hardware uh, on which it runs. Um, and that is that that combination is given by using restricted pulsar machines on TPUs to um, solve maximum satisfiability problems. All right. So very quick background, and this is going to be like super elementary for this audience, but uh, Boolean satisfiability, uh, the, the problem is you're given some Boolean formula and uh, you need to decide if there's an assignment uh, of values to the variables in this formula such that the formula evaluates to true, right? Uh, so this is an NP-complete problem, one of the famous original NP-complete problems. And typically, the Boolean formula is given in this conjunctive normal form, which means you have what are called clauses, which are these or expressions on a, on the sub, on a subset of the variables. And then these or uh, expressions, the clauses, are being anded together to define the entire formula. So I've given an example there, um, which has yeah four variables and three clauses. Um, and the question is, okay, is there an assignment of the variables x1 to x4 such that f of x evaluates to true? Now, maxat is a variant where the problem is to decide what is the maximum number of clauses that can be satisfied. Uh, so it's possible that there is there isn't an assignment that satisfies f of x that makes f of x evaluated true, um, but you still want to know what is the assignment that's going to satisfy as many clauses as possible. Okay. Um, now, quick background on restricted Boltzmann machines. I guess uh, it's not in vogue as it used to be maybe like, you know, 10 years back or 15 years back, um, but it's a fairly elegant and simple model. I, I'll just give a very quick overview. So you can think of it as essentially a graphical model uh, where there are two sets of variables in this graphical model. One set is called the visible units. They're shown in green here. And the other set is called the hidden units shown in red here. Um, and let's take uh, both the visible and hidden units to be uh, stochastic binary variables. You can generalize this to other kinds of variables, but for our purposes, binary is sufficient. So we'll take x to be a binary vector with you know, n uh, dimensions and h, the hidden vector, to be another binary vector with m dimensions. And now you have a bipartite graph structure between these two sets of units. Um, and there are learnable parameters for this model. And those learnable parameters appear on the edges between these two sets of variables. Um, so you can think of it as essentially a Markov random field, um, except now you have this structural restriction. So hence the name restricted Boltzmann machines. Now, if you look at um, how, how does this graphical model represent a distribution over these visible and hidden units, it's via an energy function. So it's, it's basically an energy-based model. So given a complete assignment for both x and h, you can compute this energy function um, using the expression that's given here um, as a function of the weights in the model. Now, given the energy, now you do the standard thing if you take, you know, 
the exponent of the negative energy and then you normalize using the partition function uh, z of theta uh, and that ends up defining the joint distribution over both x and h the x vector and the h vector now typically you're interested in the marginal distribution over only x like let's say you know x might be the pixels in an image for example right? Um, and the hidden units are there only to improve the, uh, the capacity of the model. Right? So in which case you want to know what is P theta of X, what is the distribution defined by the restricted Boltzmann machine over the visible units of interest, right? The, let's say the pixels of the image. And you can compute that by taking the joint distribution over both X and H and then just marginalizing out uh, the H vectors. Now you'll notice uh, if you have uh, a, you know, a non-trivial number of visible and hidden units, some of the summations that are listed in these expressions are going to become extremely huge. Uh, so in particular, if you look at the partition functions at theta, uh, that's a summation over all possible visible unit assignments and hidden unit assignments. So let's say you, know, you have 50 visible units and 50 hidden units. That's 100 units in total. You have to do like a summation over two to the 100 possible configurations of those variables. Uh, obviously intractable, right? So uh, typically, like when you use restrictive Boltzmann machines, you don't get to compute these actual normalized probabilities, but you deal with unnormalized probabilities. Uh, and you also don't get to marginalize out your hidden, well, in, in in general, you can't marginalize out uh, the, the hidden units as well. So um, the model is elegant, but obviously there are intractabilities. Um, and, and you know, there is an entire literature on like how do you get around these intractabilities. Uh, but let me as just as uh, I'm not going to go into all those details, uh, like, just as a very high level background, let me mention one more concept. Uh, that's particularly relevant for this talk, uh, which is what's called the free energy function. So you can think of the free energy function as the analog of the energy function, except you evaluate it just on the visible variables, the X variables, and you somehow remove the effect of the hidden variables, right? So intuitively, you can take your energy function and then you say, okay, like if I only specify X, um, then what I want to do is sort of compute some kind of expectation over E theta uh, with respect to the distribution over H conditioned on the X that you have selected, right? Um, and then there's an additional term that also needs to take into account the entropy of that distribution over H. Um, so when you do expected energy minus entropy, you get free energy. Um, just to give you a sense, an intuitive sense of what the free energy function corresponds to. Um, but it turns out that, you know, unlike many other quantities related to RBMs, uh, the free energy is actually tractable, even though at first glance, it sounds like something you shouldn't be able to compute because it involves expectations. Um, but it turns out because of the restricted architecture of this model, the fact that, you know, once you fix your visible units, your hidden units become conditionally independent, right? Um, and, and vice versa, right? Like once you fix your hidden unit values, your visible units become conditionally independent. So by exploiting this conditional independence property, it turns out that you can compute a closed form expression for this free energy, uh, which is shown at the bottom there. Um, so Basically, that's, you know, you can think of free energy as kind of an unnormalized probability um, defined only with respect to your visible units. Okay, that's a very quick summary of RBMs. Um, it's probably not very satisfactory, but um, hopefully you know, people can sort of look it up offline and then sort of go into more details. Um, now, there's one other thing that we need to know about RBMs for the context of this talk, which is how do you sample from this distribution represented by the RBM? So as I said before, an RBM represents, you know, P theta of X, where X um, is your set of visible units. 
Now, what if you want to draw a, dis uh, a sample from this distribution represented by the model? So the standard approach is to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. And one of the big advantages of MCMC in the context of RBM is that the iterations involve matrix multiplication. So like, if you know how to do matrix multiplication fast, you can do the iterations of MCMC very fast. So just to step through one uh, iteration of MCMC here, what you do is you start out with an assignment for your X variables. So that's what's shown at the bottom there in green. Uh, this could be a randomly selected assignment. And then conditioned on that assignment, you sample your hidden units. And as I mentioned before, um, once you condition on your visible units, the hidden units become conditionally independent. So that means every hidden unit can be sampled independently, um, which makes it extremely efficient. Like you can, you know, in parallel sample all your hidden units. Now, once you have sampled values for your hidden units, you can condition on that, on that sample, and now sample your visible units again. Uh, so you throw away your initial visible unit values, and now condition on, you know, the current values of your hidden units, um, your visible units now again become conditionally independent because of the bipartite structure. And now you can sample all your visible units jointly in parallel right? um, um, as a single block. And again, that computation is mainly a matrix multiplication. Um, so that's one iteration of MCMC, and the idea is that you would run you know, a large number of these iterations in order to draw a sample from the distribution represented by the model, where obviously, yeah, like the large number, what, what, what is large enough is obviously uh, an, an open question, right? Like, and it's for very complex distributions, you might have to run a huge number of steps to come up with a good sample. Um, but the idea is that, yeah, each step in itself is quite efficient if you know how to do matrix multiplication really fast. And the idea is that, you know, you start by a random assignment for your visible units. And if you do a large number of these steps of first sampling the hidden, conditioning on the visibles, and then condition on the hidden, sample the visibles again, and repeat, if you do that long enough, um, you will start drawing samples, presumably from you know the high probability regions of your space, right? Like where the model thinks um, there's significant probability mass. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is something I already explained. Uh, so this expands a little bit. Uh, so it's not just matrix multiplication. There's also the computation of a sigmoid and also Bernoulli sampling. It turns out that all of that can be done very efficiently on TPs. Okay, so now the question is, like, I went through all this background, uh, why am I explaining all of this? Um, can we design an algorithm for either SAT or MaxSAT um, that can run efficiently using neural network accelerators? Right? And obviously the answer is yes, I'm building up to that answer. Um, but this is the motivating question for explaining all this background. Now, before I go into the details of our approach, I just want to mention that there is a lot of related work in this space. Um, like, there's no way I'm going to cover all this the related work. But like, I just want to very quickly touch on some of the neighboring areas. So, first of all, there is a lot of literature on using graphical models for SAT, uh, and and like one of the best known examples is survey propagation. But like, there are lots of variants. Uh, other variants as well. Um, there have been a lot of work on using accelerators for SAT, um, like GPUs, for example. Um, I've also seen like custom hardware being designed to speed up this particular step inside SAT solvers called unit propagation. Um, there's also obviously a lot of work um, on learning search policies for SAT. In fact, many of the people who are attending this workshop um, have worked on such papers. Um, just to pull out, you know, one example: it's Neurosat is, an, is, is a 
an example of uh, learning a, a policy for um, searching over assignments. How is our work different from all of this, right? Um, this is obviously a very crowded space. Um, so one of the things we're doing here is we're kind of designing the algorithm specifically for this target hardware that we have in mind, right? So, you know, for example, we're not taking an existing algorithm and asking, okay, like, can now use TPUs to speed up that existing algorithm, right? Which is likely very difficult because a lot of these classical algorithms, they're designed for CPUs. It's kind of hard to port those very CPU specific implementations into TPUs without, you know, drastically changing like what the algorithm is, right? So here, yeah, this is why I mentioned at the beginning, like we're kind of trying out a new point in this software or algorithm hardware design space, right? And, and seeing how well that's gonna work. The other big difference is that uh, unlike a lot of the learning-based approaches for SAT, we're not learning a search policy here. Like we're not learning something that trains on some training set of instances and then generalizes to new instances at test time. So there are no distributional assumptions, right? Like there is no assumption that at test time you're going to see similar instances to what you saw at training time. Um, in fact, like yeah, our approach basically builds up the RBM on the fly for the particular instance that we're interested in solving. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how that works. So that's how our work sits in the landscape of, you know, the crowded landscape of a lot of the other work in SAP and machine learning for SAP. Okay, so now let me get, go into the details. So the, we're gonna call our approach RBM SAP. Um, it's basically a stochastic search algorithm um, for Mac SAP, uh, and it's designed specifically for GPUs and TPUs, although like all the results I'm gonna show today are going to be uh, using TPUs, not surprisingly given where I am. Um, and the main idea is the following. So like, before I go into the technical details, let me just give you like an intuitive overview. So you are given a formula as input and you wanna find some assignment uh, that maximizes the number of satisfied pauses, right? What we first do is construct a probability distribution over the variable assignments with the very specific property that assignments that satisfy more clauses will be more probable under that distribution. So we have a way to guarantee that property in the distribution that we construct. And not surprisingly, that distribution is going to be a restricted Bolton machine. And now what we do is we sample from this distribution using Markov chain Monte Carlo in order to find high probability assignments. So, you know, the most probable assignment is, the, is what you want to output for MaxSat. Um, and by using MCMC, we are doing a stochastic search for that most probable assignment. Um, and, you know, as I explained before, um, the reason this is very interesting is that the algorithm turns out to be a very good fit for neural network accelerators and it's highly scalable. And the other big benefit is that the algorithm itself is extremely simple. I mean, like I already kind of showed the cartoon description of what MCMC does. You know, at a very high level, it sounds like every step is a pair of matrix multiplies. And that's actually all there is to it. <laughs> um, it's just a large, long sequence of matrix multiplications. And because of the simplicity, actually, like, for example, like, if you look at the JAX version of our implementation, is this 40 lines. Right. So, um, yeah, the scalability and the simplicity are the main attractions here. Um, now, I, I want to, before I even show the results, I also want to sort of temper expectations in the sense that, yeah, obviously, you know, we are several decades behind sort of CPU algorithms, and we're not realistically hoping to beat CPU algorithms across the board um, in, in just one try. Um, but the fact that this approach has all these interesting benefits suggests that it's worth sort of working on further and seeing whether um, it can eventually be CPU solvers across the board. Okay, so let me go 
a bit more into a bit more detail of how RBM stat works. So you have some input formula FFX that's shown here. You know, it's basically in CNF uh, form, a bunch of clauses and it together. Um, and what we do is for every clause in the input formula, we construct an RBM. So let's call it a clause RBM. So you can see the red boxes are sort of getting mapped to um, separate RBMs for each clause. And then the visible units of these clause RBMs are the variables that appear in each of those clauses. Right. So I've sort of merged all the visible variables together into one set here, x1 to x4. Um, but they all belong to different clauses in the formula. So the edges indicate membership of the variables in the clauses. And now you can see that like the hidden units are simply being concatenated together to define uh, an RBM for the entire formula. Now, it turns out that this RBM, I'll explain a bit later, has the property I explained before, which is that um, assignments that satisfy more clauses will be more probable under this larger formula RBM. So now the task is to just sample from it. Um, and, and that can be done using the block Gibbs sampling algorithm that I explained at the beginning. Um, now, since this is just doing you know, large matrix multiplications, you can actually quite efficiently kind of distribute this across a cluster of TPUs and get you know, very fast iterations in MCMC. Now, we run MCMC on its own, but we also found that it, turn, it, it can be very helpful to combine MCMC with some classical heuristics, um, which are not friendly to implement on TPUs. So we actually run them on CPUs. Um, so there is this iterative process of sending samples from the cluster of TPUs to a CPU running the classical heuristic there and then sending back the updated sample back to the cluster of TPUs. So imagine you know, running these iterations for a large number of steps and at some time limit um, set by the user, we produce the final set of samples produced by the algorithm. We can now evaluate all those samples and then output the best assignment found. Right. And that becomes the output of the entire algorithm. So that's the very high level overview of the how the algorithm operates. Okay, so how is it possible to construct this RBM as I mentioned before, right? Um, and the other big question is, you know, even if you can construct an RBM with that desired property, right, where mm -hmm. If an assignment satisfies more clauses, it's more probable. Even if we can do that, there, a priori, there's no sort of uh, guarantee that it's going to be a very efficient RBM. Like it's not whether it's going to be a small enough RBM for this algorithm to be practical, right? Um, so imagine, you know, you have a formula with n variables. Maybe you need an exponential number of hidden units uh, with respect to n in order to construct an RBM that has the property that we need, right? And if that's the case, then it's highly unlikely that this approach is going to actually work. So we also need to make sure that the RBM is small enough that uh, it can be a practical approach. And the key insight actually comes from this paper in 2013 by James Martins and uh, his collaborators uh, called the on, on the Representational Efficiency of Restricted Voltage Machines. It's, it's a a very elegant theoretical paper that discusses what kind of distributions are efficient to represent using an RBM. And their key result was that uh, if the free energy function of the distribution that you're trying to represent is symmetric, and I'll explain what symmetric is, then it turns out that an RBM can efficiently represent it. Now, by efficient, uh, what they mean is the number of hidden units required is some low order polynomial of the number of visible units. So in the context of this paper by symmetric, what they mean is um, the output um, uh, of your function, right? Like uh, 
it only depends on the number of ones in your inputs. Like, for example, if you are looking at, let's say, an OR gate, um, the output of the OR gate only depends on the number of ones in your inputs. So that's an example of a symmetric function. So if your function has that property, um, then it turns out you can uh, efficiently represent it using an RBM. Now, the original G Martin Sadal paper had a result that showed that you would need uh, n squared hidden units, where n is the number of visible units. And then there was a subsequent paper by Gu et al. in 2019, where they showed that you can actually improve this to linear. Um, so what's great about these results, these theoretical results, um, is that this now shows us a way to construct an RBM with the required property in such a way that it's also small enough to be practical, right? Uh, and and it's, sort of, it's guaranteed to exist, right? That's uh, such an RBM. Um, so the construction is very simple. Uh, since we are assuming the input formula is given in CNF format, um, we first can look at individual clauses, which are OR gates. And as I explained before, OR is a symmetric function. What that means is that the uh, you can construct an RBM for every clause with the property that uh, satisfying assignments for that clause are more probable under that RBM distribution, right? Now, how so once you construct clause, uh, these clause RBMs, what do you do to construct the uh, RBM for the entire formula? As I hinted in the figure a few slides back, you can actually just concatenate all these clause RBMs together to construct an RBM for the entire formula. And the reason this is possible is that a restricted Boltzmann machine is essentially a product of distributions. Um, by sort of concatenating the hidden units, um, you're essentially taking the conjunction, you know, the product of the distributions represented by each of the class RBMs, right? And that uh, very simply gives you the RBM for the entire formula. And this is guaranteed to assign more probability to assignments that satisfy more clauses. And we know that, so, you know, let's consider the case where the input formula has some constant clause size, right? Like, let's say it's like a three sat problem where every clause has three uh, literals in it. Um, then you know that uh, this RBM will only have a linear number of hidden units with respect to the number of variables in the formula, which is exactly the kind of property you want to have, right? Like, I mean, if it were, for example, exponential, then there's no hope that this approach is going to work. But the fact that you can guarantee that it's linear um, makes this approach very tractable. Okay. Um, so this is just, you know, pictorially describing what I explained verbally before. Every clause results in a clause RBM, which then gets concatenated together uh, into a form of an RBM. And by the way, this property that more satisfying assignments are more probable, this is a requirement that's met exactly. It's not an approximation. Um, and, and yeah, the, the RBM is guaranteed to satisfy this property by the results from Martin Zedal and Wu et al. Okay, so um, how do we construct the parameters of this uh, clause RBM? So if you actually look at the proofs in Martin et al. and uh, Gu et al., they actually provide constructive proofs where like, you can actually, they, they provide a recipe for constructing an RBM um, the, the, that has this particular property. And by the way, uh, just, just to clarify one thing, uh, both of those papers are actually, like, they have nothing to do with SAT. They're just broadly looking at the problem of uh, what are the distributions efficiently representable by the RBMs? And there is no reference to SAT there. Um, the application of these ideas to SAT or max SAT is our uh, contribution. Um, so you can analytically compute these clause RBM parameters if you want. 
Um, and this is tractable if you can guarantee that the cloth size is small, like let's say you know, up to like, let's say 10 to 20 variables. Um, it should be fine to analytically construct uh, the, the, the weights. Um, but empirically, what we found out to work much better is to actually learn an RBM to represent an OR gate um, directly from the truth table of an OR gate um, for whatever size, right? Like clause size that you that you are interested in, right? So, like let's say your in input problem has clause size seven, then we would construct a seven input OR gate um, by training an RBM. Uh, on on the truth table for that, and it turns out uh, these learned class RBMs produce uh, give much better mixing than um, these analytically constructed class RBMs. And one of the nice things about this is that you can actually train these RBMs offline before you even see your input formula. And then once you see your input formula, you get these clauses with different variables in them with different polarities on the variables in each clause and so forth. And there is a way to analytically transform the parameters of the sort of canonical OR gate RBM into any of the uh, other combinations of polarities uh, of your input variables that's seen in the, in the input formula. And th this is, just a simple transformation that's uh, very fast to apply. So this is how we're actually able to construct the RBM on the fly um, when we receive an input formula. You don't need to do any kind of long training on that particular instance to construct the RBM. It's We, we just take these pre-trained OR gates and transform them for the particular problem that we want to solve. Okay, so I also mentioned uh, a classical heuristic that we apply in conjunction to Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and it's based on this idea called unit propagation, which would be sort of very familiar to those of you who know the SAT literature. So unit propagation is the idea that um, if you have a partial assignment for your variables in uh, for, for a given formula, you can work out sort of the direct implications of those that, the, those partially assigned variables on the remaining unassigned variables. And that allows you to sort of fill in some of the variables that are currently unassigned because they're directly implied by the ones that are already assigned. Um, so this turns out to be extremely useful in many classical SAT solvers, uh, it's in fact, you know, in the state of the art SAT solvers that use uh, conflict driven clause learning type approaches, uh, most of the time is actually spent doing unit propagation. Um, so it's actually a, a very powerful heuristic. And we apply this in conjunction with MCMC because uh, it's actually a, a very nice way to make large jumps in, uh, outside of MCMC uh, that can allow MCMC to sort of get unstuck and sort of escape bad local optima. Um, so since in MCMC, we are always dealing with complete assignments, uh, we need some way to sort of select which variables are we going to treat as assigned and which ones are we going to throw the assignments away for, right? Um, so one heuristic we use here is to look at the variance, the temporal variance of variables you know, across the chain. Right. So if there's variables that are not changing much across a large number of MCMC steps, then we prioritize those variables higher to be unassigned because we think, okay, maybe those variables are defining some local optimum that may not be very good. So let's unassign them to sort of escape that and move somewhere else in the search space. And then once we unassign those variables, um, we use unit propagation to fill in as many of the, the newly unassigned variables as we can. And then we continue with uh, the MCMC afterwards, right? So we may not end up reassigning all the variables that we initially unassigned, in which case uh, we would you know, end up using um, the previous assignments for those variables. Uh, and then we would continue MCMC from that point onwards. 
This turns out to be surprisingly effective. Um, in fact, this heuristic was kind of an accidental discovery we made while we were working on a different project. Um, and it turned out that uh, if you look at the archive paper that I linked there, uh, this heuristic on its own, right, without any of the machine learning stuff or the accelerator stuff, can actually rank second uh, on randomly generated instances from uh, SAP competitions in 2017 and 18. Um, it's it's surprisingly strong, and you know the code for it is actually quite short. Now we think. Well, we originally thought the heuristic might be exploiting some artifact of how these randomly generated instances um, they have. Um, but it turns out that, yeah, it still remains quite effective when combined with the MCMC approach that we're using here. Um, so anyway, like a surprise baseline discovery that we made. Um, and yeah, so we apply this heuristic periodically. Uh, so most of the time is spent on MCMC, and then every once in a while we would send our samples off to the T CPU, do this heuristic, and then come back to the TPU cluster to continue with the MCMC. All right, so let me show some results. Um, how do we evaluate this? So we've been looking at MaxSat competitions, uh, in particular, these four years from 2018 to 2021. Our current implementation is does not scale to the largest instances that appear in these competitions. So we have limited the size of uh, the problems to have a class size less than or equal to seven and fewer than 10,000 variables and fewer than 100,000 clauses. So I would say, you know, it, it's not small. Uh, these instances are not small, but um, there are instances with like you know hundreds of thousands of variables and millions of clauses and so forth in these competitions. So we haven't yet scaled up to the largest sizes that appear um, there yet. In principle, you know this algorithm is very scalable as long as you have enough TPUs to sort of shard your matrix multiplies across um, that. Sort of, you know, highly scalable imp implementation also requires significant engineering effort, which we currently don't have. So, um, we haven't yet done, you know, the ultra scalable version of this algorithm yet. Um, and following the rules of these uh, MaxSat evaluations, uh, actually, yeah, it's not called a competition; it's called an evaluation. Um, it's a time limit of three hundred seconds. All the solvers that participate in these, in these evaluations, they run on a CPU. Uh, we compare their results. So these results are publicly available. So we compare directly against the publicly available results. We compare that to RBMSAT running on a CPU. So the hardware is now comparable to what the, comp the evaluation solvers use. And we consider the setting where RBMSAT is given this unfair hardware advantage because it can actually make use of that advantage, which is to have an entire TPU cluster and also an attached host CPU um, on which the classical heuristic would run. And the evaluation metric that's used uh, in these evaluations is what's called the average incomplete score. So the incomplete score is defined as uh, shown here, where you get a particular solver and an instance, solver I, um, and jth instance in the evaluation, you know the best result obtained across all the solvers. So that's this C best um, of J. That's the lowest number of uh, unsat clauses that any solver achieved. And then um, in the uh, denominator, you have the number of clauses achieved by the solver that's being evaluated, the ith solver on the jth instance. So it's a score that's between zero and one, um, where one is the best. Uh, and you now average the score across instances to get um, a single score for the entire set of instances. So obviously, yeah, wait, you know, higher is better. All right, so let's look at the results. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, we looked at these four years, 2018 to 21. Uh, on the left, I've listed the solver name in sorted order by average incomplete score. And yeah, you can see the average incomplete scores in the, in the right column of each of those subtables. And you can see that across the four years, uh, RBM SAT running on 64 TPUs is outperforming the publicly available results for all these other participating solvers um, listed here. And to our surprise, RBM SAT just using a single CPU, so that's comparable hardware to all the other uh, solvers you know, that listed in the tables, is still outperforming those other solvers on three out of the four years. So 2021 is the only year where RBM sat running on a CPU is not doing as well, um, uh, better than the other ones. Um, now, again, the big caveat is that uh, we did select a subset of instances based on size. Um, you know, obviously, we would have to evaluate on the entire set of instances to get a complete picture. Um, but the fact that it's producing these results even on that subset is quite promising. Okay, now what happens, you know, in MCMC, so one of the benefits is that you can run multiple chains in parallel and that effectively is like a batched computation, right? Because it's exactly the same computation you're applying to a large set of instances. And you can ask, okay, as you increase the size of that batch, what kind of improvement in performance are you getting? Um, so the left plot is showing, you know, as a function of the bat size, how does the average incomplete score uh, behave across the four competition years? And you can see that, you know, not surprisingly, there is an, a benefit as you add more and more parallel chains. But you can also see that it's not like sort of exponentially taking off or anything. There is definitely a tapering off of the improvements um, as you increase uh, the number of parallel chains. And on the right-hand side, you can see what happens when you increase the size of the cluster. Uh, so we went all the way from one TPU to 64 TPUs. And there's a big improvement when you go from like one to four. Um, but after that, the improvements are not as big. Now, one possibility is that for the instances that we're considering, maybe, you know, the, the benefits of more scaling is kind of you know, is dying off, um, and like the, it's it's an issue of diminishing returns. Um, as we scale to larger instances, maybe these curves will, you know, continue to show improvements as we increase both the number of TPUs and the batch size. Okay, now I mentioned you know there are these two components of yeah RBMs combined with the classical unit propagation heuristic. So how are these parts contributing to the final result? So if you run unit propagation only, um, which actually is the, the um, baseline I mentioned earlier, which is performing extremely well on randomly generated instances on some SAT competitions from previous years, that baseline does not do very well uh, in this case. So that's the UP only row shown at the bottom of this table. And you can see that the average incomplete score drops quite drastically. Uh, the next uh, ablation is, okay, what if, you know, we just do random, uniform random sampling rather than RBM MCMC sampling, right? Like, are we getting any benefit by actually doing MCMC or is it just fine to uniformly randomly generate lots of assignments? That surprisingly does quite well. You can see the, um, the average incomplete scores shooting up, but still quite a bit worse than the best results. Now, the next question is, okay, what if you remove unit propagation uh, from the algorithm, right? So it's going to be pure MCMC running only on the TPU cluster, no uh, classical heuristic on the CPU. That um, is still worse than the best results. So the unit propagation heuristic is crucial for getting the best performance. Um, but it's still like 
yeah, reasonably close to the the final performance that we get for the entire algorithm, which is the the top row. Okay, um, this is just a, a simple study that we did um, where we wanted to know, you know, obviously the issue is like as we scale to much larger instances with a lot more pauses and a lot more variables, how will MCMC itself scale, right? Because maybe you will need, you know, an impractically large number of MCMC steps to come up with good assignments, in which case, again, the practicality of this algorithm may not be that interesting. Um, so this is kind of an imperfect study. We took factoring as an example domain. Uh, one of the nice things about factoring is that you can construct instances of many different sizes, and it's also known to be hard. Although, you know, solving factoring as either MATSAT or SAT is not something that's typically done. Uh, so this is purely for, you know, as a, as a case study to understand how does our algorithm behave as we sweep over the size of the problem. So on the left part, you can see the behavior of the algorithm as a function of the number of clauses in the problems. And on the right, you see the same plot, but for the number of variables. And on the y-axis, we're plotting the number of unsatisfied clauses. Obviously, like in factoring, you know, a partially satisfying assignment does not have any meaning. Uh, this is purely just to see uh, how does Gibbs behave as we increase the size of the problem. And, you know, maybe somewhat promisingly, like it's not showing some exponential uh, increase in the number of unsatisfied clauses as we increase the 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 size of the problem instances. So again, a more detailed study is needed here, but at least on this very sort of limited study, um, maybe there is hope for much larger instances once we scale up our implementation to handle them. Okay, so uh, let me wrap up with some extensions. Uh, the block Gibbs algorithm I explained is actually kind of, you know, the simplest possible sampling algorithm you can apply. There are actually much more interesting algorithms available that are also potentially a much better fit to this kind of parallel hardware. One example is parallel tempering, where like, you can try multiple temperatures in parallel and, so, and exchange particles between uh, these parallel chains, um, which is a very good fit for this kind of parallel hardware. And it involves the same kind of, uh, the, the, in each iteration, you are performing the same kind of computations, matrix multiplications. The other interesting direction is, so we considered MaxSat here, but it will be interesting to also look at SAT and also SharpSat. So it turns out that, so SharpSat is the variant where uh, you're trying to estimate the number of satisfying assignments for a formula. Um, and you can actually show that this is related to the problem of estimating the partition function of the RBM. And there are methods in the literature, like such as Neil the important SAP uh, that's designed to solve to, to sort of estimate the partition function of RPMs, which can be applied. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, as you would have noticed, we don't have any models that are learned on some distribution of instances and generalizes to new instances. The RBM is constructed on the fly for each instance at test time, right? So there's no separate training phase. Um, but it would definitely be interesting to consider, you know, especially for these application distributions, right? Like there is some application where there's a very structured distribution of instances and you can learn on instances offline, uh, good policies, either to initialize the RBM or perhaps to control the, uh, the proposal distributions used in the MCMC uh, steps, um, such that um, the, the, the GIPS chains converge a lot faster. Okay, uh, that's it. And the, the key takeaway uh, I want to put in your minds is this idea that, you know, it sounds obvious, but um, it, it's like an idea that can um, use a lot more thoughts or a lot more um, new efforts, which is, you know, new hardware enables new algorithms. And it might actually be very beneficial to sort of think um, about approaches that are very different from the current state-of-the-art algorithms. 
and rather than trying to improve the existing state of the art, um, you know, maybe explore a completely new direction. Um, and what I proposed here is, you know, one initial idea. Obviously, there are lots of improvements that can be applied to this particular idea itself, but I also think there are probably many other ideas that are different from what I proposed, uh, which could fit into this regime of exploiting um, new hardware in very different ways. Um, and obviously, yeah, there is, uh, we're, we're kind of behind from classical algorithms by several decades. Like those algorithms have a huge head start. So I don't think realistically we can beat them in, in one paper. <laughs> Um, but I still think it's quite interesting to explore the space. Thank you.